do one thing. So I'm happy to be back. And the reason my time is scarce is because sometimes, if you don't know, I'm on the board of Petaluma Community Access. Very important to me. I am the treasurer. And sometimes our board meetings fall on my radio show day because it is there on Tuesday. So um, I was also on travel for a while. So that's another reason. But anyway, so I'm back. Uh, I'm here today. I unfortunately will not be back on air until the 30th of this month because as I just mentioned one of my board meetings conflicts and so let's get started bear with me I am super tired today so <laughs> uh, your patience is appreciated um, so I do take if you don't know I do take uh, questions on my live uh, Facebook feed and the page is the DG the 30 something page so you can look that up if you are interested on Facebook and interested in asking questions. I also take questions via email. I don't take them live while I'm in the studio just because it's one more little distraction. But if you do want to email me after, I'm also very happy. Um, I always am willing to provide all the resources and everything that I've, I've read off of or used during my show. So uh, you can email me at d-o-m-a-y-n-e at m-a-b-e-r-m-e dot com. And, uh, you know, not a lot of people have taken me up on it, but if you are interested in learning more or want to know where I get all my information, I will let you know. So let's get started. Um, I have a big topic today and I have a lot of information to try to get through. So we are going to be talking about affordable housing, but not just affordable housing, but um, the the barriers, I want to call them the people barriers. So I'm not talking about, I mean, it does break down to why there are physical, more hard barriers, like policy barriers and stuff like that, which, um, and the bureaucracy, which is part of this story. But I'm really going to talk about the people, people's perceptions and those type of barriers to, um, deal with affordable housing and you know wherever you fall on the topic there are some hard facts about you know where everything lines up and why it doesn't line up and so I am going to be talking about that today and uh, I do have some new listeners so thank you for that and I do get good feedback uh, please share I try to get my I'm way behind so I shouldn't even be saying this but I do try to get my videos on my website, which is dominica.ninja, so D-O-M-E-N-I-C-A dot ninja, in a relatively quick fashion, but if you, if not, you can see all my old videos on there, so all my old radio shows. I've been on air for about two years now, I think, so you can check out all those old shows if you feel so inclined, um, and then the subject matter is in the header. And again, I'm also, one thing that I know a lot of people, my friends and acquaintances do, is they want to talk it through to see which shows might be of the most interest of them. So I'm happy to do that too, is help guide you to which shows, because I mean, I would love for you to go through and watch all of them, <laughs> but that is quite the commitment. So um, I'm happy to kind of talk through and see what your interests are. My main goal in this show is to get people more involved in the civic process uh, and understand it. And so anything I can do to help facilitate that. And I am willing to work with people of all ages. So let's get started. Uh, and if you have ideas, I know I say this every show and I very rarely get ideas from people. Um, but I do try to keep it as nonpartisan as possible. And um, it is a policy issue based show. So I'm not doing the news. Um, I choose specific topics like affordable housing to address. So. If you do have ideas, please send them over. I'm on every other week unless I have another conflict. So there's plenty of time to send ideas over. So please do. And um, if you want to be on my show, I would love that. So um, I love to have people on the show and you can call in. Anyway, so um, my last part of my spiel that I forgot at the beginning when I was introducing KPCALP, um, in Petaluma, California, just in case you didn't know, is that we very much rely on donations from the community. We are a community access station, 
and we open our doors to any community member that has a voice that they want to share, an expression that they want to share. And I always say that I am a strong believer that this is something that helps preserve our democracy because we're giving the voice to people at the local level. Um, that being said, if people want to keep our doors open, there's a few different ways to help. You can donate. Uh, any little bit helps. You can volunteer. Uh, that's another big one. You can become a member and you can just become a friends of supporting member. Um, if you, you know, want to be able to donate that amount each year. And so there's several ways. So just contact us, uh, look at our website and, um, we appreciate all of the support. Uh, we do have an event coming up on May 20th and we are looking for donations. So if you have the means to provide, if you have a business and want to provide a gift certificate or something like that, uh, we are looking for donations for our raffle for that event. All right, let's get into this. Uh, you've gotten enough of my spiel. We're already seven minutes in. So I want to start by giving some housing statistics in Sonoma County because I think it is a good basis to start the whole conversation. So, um, about affordable housing. So the median household income in Sonoma County is 71,769. So the median household income is the total income for a household. So for a family, um, if you're a renter, you're considered your own household. So I always want to clarify that when they say median household income, it's as reported on the census or in your taxes and all that kind of stuff. So uh, as a renter, you're your own household, but uh, otherwise it's really, you know, you think of families and their, their entire income as a family. So that is the median household income. The population, this probably should have come first, is 504,000 people. Again, and this is census data. So, um, in order, I'm gonna jump down a little bit, so, cause it'll be relevant with the median household income. In order for a family or an individual to be able to afford a home at the median household, um, or the average uh, price of a home is $640,000 in Sonoma County. So in order for reasonably a household to afford a home, they would need to have a, a household income of $138,000, almost $139,000 a year. So I think that gives some, some, shed some light on the difference between making $139,000 a year with the average household income being almost $72,000 a year. Um, so that's really something to consider uh, rent. So actually I was looking at census data, but I have a more, uh, current statistic that the average now in Sonoma County for a one bedroom, one bathroom apartment is $1,700 a month. Um, and so, and my number is 1400. So I would say between those two numbers, but again, this is census data. So it's a little outdated because we're getting a new census next year. Uh, so Again, that kind of illustrates where we're at. Um, it's expected that you'll pay one third of your income in rent and uh, no more than one third of your income. But I mean, one third of your income is a significant amount of income. And let's see. So I have the renter rate. So the owner occupied, let's see. So again, this is, it's, kind of hard because this is census data so sometimes it's an estimate or it's it's older data but the estimate is that uh 55 percent of the housing in Sonoma County is owner occupied and 44 percent is uh renter occupied and in 2017 it looked like it rise. that was in 2010 in 2017 it looks like it went up to 60.3 percent and uh for owner occupied and so you can kind of see it's actually pretty split. I was surprised. I thought there would be more owner occupied housing than there was. So it's pretty split with the renter and the owner occupied housing in Sonoma County. So uh, just side notes, our poverty rate is lower than the state of California. Ours is 11.3% with the state is 17%. But again, I think 
so the poverty rate for a household of four is $25,750. So we're talking about a third of the median household income and 11% of our population falling into that. And so that's a significant, in my opinion, that's a significant amount of people that are falling, like we're talking about the severely poor. Uh, and then we talk about the working poor, where these numbers about median household income versus income necessary to own a home at the average rate, uh, that that was what I would consider the, 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 it's not the middle class poor, but we've lost our middle class in a lot of ways in the area. So, or we are losing our middle class in the area. So let me see if there's any more data I wanna throw at you. So homelessness, there's about 3,000 people without permanent homing, uh, homes in Sonoma County, and that's who's reported. So again, I would venture to guess there's significantly more people that don't have permanent housing, but they aren't being reported or they don't understand that couch surfing or going from place to place isn't permanent housing. It's not permanent housing. So again, 30%. Uh, let me see. So sorry. Okay. Anyway, um, I don't have all this data memorized. I have a lot of data memorized, but I don't have the housing data memorized. <laughs> so, I mean, Part of the issue with Sonoma County is specifically is that, in my mind, is we want to be able to people to live and work here because uh, 30, what is it, 36.9% of our population, our working population is commuting out of Sonoma County, which means that they can't make the money they need within Sonoma County to live in Sonoma County, which is a common thing. And there's articles out there now showing about how the standard of living is increasing faster than the pay scales in Sonoma County. So nearly 40% of our population is commuting out of Sonoma County, which increases emissions. It's taking tax money out of here for their daily expenses, um, gas, anything like that. So, uh, and it hurts local business as well. So we want people to be able to live and work in Sonoma County. We want to address homelessness, huge issue. Uh, Sonoma County experiences less homelessness than other municipalities, but that doesn't mean it's any less important. Um, and then displacement. We want to address displacement because people, so I didn't, I couldn't find, the Press Democrat reported this, but I couldn't find like a hard source where they said nearly 50% of people ages 18 to 39 are leaving the area, which wouldn't be shocking to me. That's not a shocking statistic to me to think that people in that demographic are leaving. I, I mean, I can barely hold on here. So, and I'm in that demographic, obviously 30 something up to 39. People always ask me what's going to happen when I turn 40. And if I sell my radio show and I have to rename myself, I'm like, okay, well, we'll talk about that in, what is that? Seven years. We can talk about that. If I sell my radio show, <laughs> I'll be the 40 something then. So, uh, DG the millennial is probably what I would change it to. So now let's talk about, so as I put my posting, I am going to be doing my radio show today based on this report called You Don't Have to Live Here. It is written by, so an extensive amount of research went into this, like so much research. It's, it's almost hard for me to fathom the kind of research they had to do like archival research so going through they went through everything from old data to news article and a news article audit which i can tell you is not the easiest thing in the world to do is go back and see all the newspaper articles about the topic uh and so a lot of work went into this and it was a national effort so that's why i really wanted to i was very impressed by this research and so that's why i want to share it with you so it was written by Tiffany Manuel, um, and she's the Vice President of Knowledge, Impact, and Strategy at Enterprise Community, Community Partners Incorporated. So uh, again, if you wanna get further information directly from her, just contact me and I can give you the contact information. I haven't met her personally, but uh, I would love to. And so, and then the other our author is Kate Kendall Taylor. She's the Chief Executive Offer of, Officer of Frameworks Institute. So that was one of the agencies that did a majority of the research. So if you're interested, as I am in this kind of social civic research, then, um, you know, check, check them out. 
All right, so, okay. Sorry, I'm checking my Facebook to see, see what's up, you know? Okay. Let's get to the nitty gritty now. So I, so again, this show is about the people pushback in affordable housing. So, uh, I mean, which I think I have said before that messaging and outreach and transparency, but then the people's perception of everything is what is the biggest debilitator to any sort of policy advancement, uh, community advancement and stuff like that. So this is just about the people pushback. Uh, they actually frame this study as how to the communication barriers, but for me, it really builds the entire picture. So of why we have so many barriers. So let's start talking about pushbacks. And I've really come to the conclusion that, and I'm jumping to my conclusion at the very beginning is that people in Sonoma County don't want housing. Okay. So I said that they claim they want housing but they don't want it to impact their lives directly or they perceive that it's gonna impact their lives directly. They want it like way out, out of the way where it can't even be developed uh, for a myriad of reasons in a lot of locations. So I will come back to this point. Uh, so, but I just, I, it's just something that I have learned so prominently that people are so pro housing as long as it's not in their backyard and this idea of high density housing which isn't the enemy like we need high density housing we don't need a bunch of single family homes because it's inaccessible as i just explained the the market rate uh so so goes life all right let's get into this so the first barrier that is explained in this study is mobility, personal responsibility, and self-makingness. So they have quotes at the at the beginning of each one, which helps explain the barrier. So I'm gonna go through the name of the, the barrier and then the quote that explains it and then some more of my analysis of the situation, just so you know how it's being set up. So mobility, personal responsibility, and self-makingness, kind of a little bit self-explanatory if you can get all those words in. So um, the quote that goes with it is, buy the house you can afford or move, stop making poor decisions and ask me to pay for them. So the whole rationale behind this pushback is that people are in this situation where they can't find housing or can't live in an area because they are poor, managers of money, they are irresponsible or they're lazy and that sounds harsh, but I think it is a common argument that we have all come up against for a various, various things, whether it's unemployment or inability to find housing or inability to find permanent housing, inability to buy housing. There's this, and it's, I think the best, the, the descriptive in this one is the personal responsibility. So it's putting it all in that individual that they have made bad decisions and therefore they cannot purchase a home or find housing. Um, so that one I think is pretty self-explanatory. And again, I think it's something that, okay. <laughs> I was about to say it's something that we all understand, but I can't say that because otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here doing this and this report wouldn't exist. So let's get on to the next one. Cause again, I think that that one is pretty self-explanatory. So the next one is separate fates and zero sum thinking. So this one was something that I didn't understand when I read it. So I had to read the quote below and the quote is the issue has nothing to do with me. It's not my responsibility to solve other people's problems. So this is similar to the last one where it is this very individualistic feeling that I'm doing okay. And therefore, it's not my responsibility. You know, I'm hardworking. I'm tax paying. It's not my responsibility to have to address the issues of other people. And this happens because there's a lack of connectedness and connection to a community. And I've talked a lot about breakdown of communities in the United States because we have been fed this whole, you can be whatever you want, but you have to do it on your own. 
uh, the, the huge message is you can do whatever you want. You can be whoever you want. You can overcome adversity because you can make the decision to overcome adversity. But the underlying part of that is that we're saying, but you have to do it on your own because we don't believe in community. We believe that each person has to make their own decisions. They have to make their own success. Now, and there's a breakdown of culture there because we have created, and it's getting worse if you follow the federal, the federal uh, hate crime rates and stuff like that, is that we are, we've become so individualistic that we don't have that tribal community base that we as humans, in my opinion, thrive off of uh, and many other cultures around the world, including com communities within this country, have shown that that whole, this is my community, this is my tribe, we need to support each other, we need to help each other, we need to watch each other's kids, we need to help this person find a job, we need to do all those things are what contributes to the success of populations. And that's one of the social determinants of health. So uh, environment and built environment is a social determinant of health, but in addition, uh, having social connections indicates part of your health so this one speaks to that lack of connection with other people and that lack of community and you know in Petaluma we talk about how we have this really strong close-knit community and everyone cares about each other and everyone went that is true probably more than other areas because we do have a relatively small community and we do have the character that is very welcoming but that doesn't mean that, again, you're going to get away from this, well, I own my house and I'm happy here and I don't want affordable housing next door. So let's go to the next one because um, I do have six of these and then I have solutions. So the next one is thin understanding of cause and effect. So what has changed? Why is this happening to so many people these days? So... I think what this is speaking to much is people have this perception that, and it, it, it is getting worse in certain areas. I mean, I think it's getting worse nationally because, you know, they show that people on minimum wage can't afford a one bedroom apartment anywhere in the country. And, uh, it is becoming increasingly difficult in the Bay area. I mean, it's tangible. You can feel how difficult it is. So it's not shocking. Um, but what I love that they address in this backfire is the lack of understanding of the bureaucracy and what it takes to develop affordable housing. Uh, and there's little under understanding of the history of the problem. And so then it's oversimplified, which is some of these other backfires is that there's an oversimplification of how we got to this point because people don't understand what it really takes to, not even affordable housing, what it takes to build housing. Um, I mean, there are way less barriers to, to building just market rate housing. And again, I think it has a lot to do with this people backfire. Um, and that's, you know, a huge priority in Petaluma is affordable housing, but there's no plan to actually make it work. So I'll get to that later. So little history of, so this is something that hits home. So gentrification, I say that this is a loaded word. And the reason it's a loaded word is because I think when you say that people clam up and they have, if they even know what it means, but people that know what it means, they shut down because it's such a loaded word where it elicits this response in people. And so, and I've gotten a lot of pushback personally in communities I've worked with because it's not that I don't think this should, shouldn't be talked about. We're talking about messaging. I don't recommend using that word uh, when it comes to general housing messaging. And Again, and it's for that reason that people, and there's a way to have a productive conversation about gentrification without the general messaging being like, you're gentrifying our communities and what are you gonna do about it? I mean, that's, um, again, it's 
all I can say is that it is a loaded word. And, you know, the study points out that a lot of the gentrification has to do with a lack of community planning because it, you know, basically talks about, which is totally intuitive, it talks about how through, quote, gentrification, there are other investments in communities. So they might be bringing in new businesses. They might bring, be bringing in new market rate housing. But this is a poor community planning technique because it's not addressing those who are already there. It's not creating a community around the people that are already there. It's pushing them out. Um, and so you need the investments of the businesses. Um, but there are ways to plan for communities without having to cause a huge outflow of the people that live there. So, um, and I think I have it written here somewhere. Okay, yeah, I'll get to it. So the next one is the crisis and fatalism backfire. So uh, the quote is, you're saying we have to address poverty and change the housing market? Good luck. How can we address an issue this large? So for those who don't know, I have a career based in public health marketing, um, self-taught marketer, background in public health. And so I have dealt a lot with these messaging issues and I get a lot of pushback uh, because I align so much with this report, which is why I am so happy to share it. But what we so often do is we message in crisis mode. So we put out all this information, like there's this crisis, and what it does is it overwhelms people um, because they don't, you know, their their mind is telling them that there's no way uh, that these issues can be dealt with, you know? There's just no way. Um, and so when you overwhelm people like that, you they don't want to be engaged anymore. Uh, and that's really dangerous because we need people to be engaged and we need them to understand the process. So instead of having a solution-based messaging, we have this crisis messaging like, oh my God, I mean, even during the fires. And again, that was a crisis. That was a crisis. That was a terrible situation that affected this entire community. Both fires, the Mendocino County fires and the Stomach County fires. Um, but we have to lead with a calm where you don't want to cause a traumatic response by having such a dramatic response to the issue. Um, and people can't relate. It's not that they can't, they can't relate to the crisis if they're not in crisis. They can't relate to a housing crisis if they're doing fine. People can relate to it who are in the housing crisis, but Again, we have a relatively low poverty level. We have, it's lower than the state of California, uh, which is 17%, I think, poverty level. And ours is 11, 11%. So anyway, you can't leave with crisis. And this goes across all messaging and marketing, all of it. Uh, I say it all the time that we have this inclination to so explain the problem. I actually, almost didn't get my thesis because during my, in my thesis and in my thesis presentation, I talked about how we need to start studying the protective factors. So the reasons why people are healthy, the reasons why people are successful, instead of constantly studying the problem, because we have such a habit of studying the problem, like this is the problem and we're going to beat it over the head. Um, and so we need to start addressing the solutions and looking at why people are successful and not why they're failing, uh, because that will really help us heal people. Heal, I shouldn't use that word, but it'll really help us make communities well. If we can help show them how to be well based on research that shows that that's how other people have done it without having to leave their community. I mean, that's a big thing as a lot of people have to leave their community. And I have, I have, oh, let me think. I think this is more appropriate. No, it's not actually, I think it's appropriate here. So I've had people, I've had someone, for example, that I was talking about, you know, I worked for a tribe for two and a half years and on a reservation 
and I was talking about the individual struggles of living on a reservation. And they said, well, why don't they just do better and leave? And that falls into this whole mentality. You want people to be able to stay in their communities and you want them to serve their communities. I think that's a big thing is, you know, I came back to Petaluma and I've been committed to serving Petaluma and that's what you're supposed to do, not supposed to do, but that's like what a strong community does. And so we talk so much in Petaluma about this high level engagement, but that's just how it's supposed to be. Um, instead of focusing on these communities that have a high level of engagement, whether you agree with it or not, I don't agree with a lot of the, you know, what's going on. Um, which if you know me, you know, <laughs> but at the same time, we fail to look at the communities apply so apply why a community like this is so engaged and take that information and go into community that's not engaged and look at why not now we live in a white county we live in a white city here um and so again i'm making a loaded comment now but there's a lot that goes into that and that's not a that's a fact i mean i don't have the stats in front of me i have them somewhere in my arsenal of radio show facts but white people obviously don't face the same adversity it's equal payday for women and uh, obviously women have a pay gap, but then women of color have an even more severe pay gap. So there's just these realities of systematic segregation and racism that we have going on that really affect our process. And um, I'll try to remember to come back to this in my conclusion because I have more I want to say about that, but I, I want it to be at the end. So let's talk about the next, the NIMBYs. So I, I felt so special because I had to look up what a NIMBY was and I've been in this field for a long time. No, not explicitly in housing. So uh, I worked with housing authorities and housing departments, but I haven't been super ingrained in it. So a NIMBY is a not in my backyard. Er, <laughs> that's like a word, up, uh, make up a word. So these are the people that... Um, so the name of the backfire is the NIMBY natural segregation. So, and by natural segregation, it's again, it's this idea that, oh, we want you to have housing, but not in my backyard. So the quote is, who wants to live next to poor people? I worked in the ghetto and I got out and, oh, so I wanted to read this quote. So this report, you wouldn't believe, so they have quotes from um, media sources and stuff in here and you would not believe what people say <laughs> i couldn't believe what people say but the pro the other issue is that i feel that um this is how a lot of people feel and why while they may not say it so explicitly explicitly as these quotes that are pulled out of these news articles the problem is that a lot of people agree uh, they won't say it, but they agree. So the quote is, is, uh, and everything was kept anonymous in here. Nobody wants to live with low class blacks, not even middle class blacks. The best we can do is keep them in de facto reservations like East St. Louis and Camden, Camden, New Jersey. Anything more than that is just a waste of time and money. Spreading them around more is like a recipe for all kinds of trouble. So I don't know if that's shocking to you, but that was shocking to me. Uh, again, it's not shocking in the sense that people feel that way, because I know people feel that way. But it's shocking in the sense that that's how people really believe that. So we already put tribal communities, we already put Native Americans on reservations, so now we should put poor black people on reservations too. Uh, and I won't even get into how terrible the reservations have treated the Native Americans. Um, but it is, it just goes to show how people really think and how hard this issue is to address when you have people that are like, well, I don't want to live next to poor black people. Maybe this person is a middle class black person. They're saying, I don't, I don't want to live next to a poor black person. Uh, that's racist <laughs> and many other things, but so I, I, I wanted to read that but also what's highlighted in this point is so this is inherent racial and economic segregation because again people in certain neighborhoods and the thing is that people in these neighborhoods they 
come out and have a big voice because they're not disenfranchised neighborhoods. These are middle class and upper class neighborhoods that are saying, "You, we don't want you here. We don't want you here. And their voices are so loud because like I said, they're not disenfranchised communities and it's so hard to get those low opportunity disenfranchised communities involved in the civic process that we only hear these really loud voices that are saying, not here, not in my backyard. You can't do it anywhere else. Um, and you know, I always talk quite a bit about the fake liberals in the area where they fall into this category. They fall into the NIMBY category where they're like, oh, well, we want services and we want housing and we want all these things, but I don't want it near me. So uh, it's a huge issue. And again, it, it has created this inherent racial and economic segregation. And I don't think there was actual, a, an actual statistic in the report, but it talks about how many Americans think that racism is a thing of the past. Segregation and racism is a thing of the past. So it isn't a curtain, um, sorry, a current issue, which is again, shocking. That means that there's such a lack of connection to what's going on in the country. And I got to speed up a little bit. So let me get to the last uh, barrier. So the facts don't fit the frame. Most people I know are doing pretty okay. This, da this data doesn't make sense. Here we are, we know this right now. People don't like data. They have a self-fulfilling prophecy. They want to believe what they believe. They wanna confirm what they believe. And so they automatically assume that the data is wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Well, if it's not, if it doesn't align with my opinion, then it's wrong. And uh, I don't think I need to say any more about that. So why is this important? So really we need major overhauls in policy and well-planned communities as I was talking about. So communities, so I think it's, I wrote, I'm pretty sure it's a Whole Foods and Bayview they put a Whole Foods in Bayview and you're talking about a traditionally very poor neighborhood and they put a Whole Foods in there. So how accessible is that? And correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure there's a Whole Foods in Bayview because I had a client down there and I was just kind of shocked to see the development that had happened. And then across the street, you have homeless people sleeping on the street. Um, so, and we, so the whole point of this whole conversation is we need to change the narrative. So there are solutions that are provided in here. And so I want to, because, and so, you know, I think a lot of this is people have tried to isolate this information to government employees um, and housing advocates. But even if you're not an outright affordable housing advocate, if you believe in changing the narrative, you need to help change the narrative. And so this is good for all of us to start thinking about how we talk about the issues, especially for advocates. If this is something that you're really caring about and advocating for, then you need to know how to have a conversation. Uh, and that's why it was so important for me to have this show because this presentation was given to housing advocates, government officials, nonprofit employees. Um, but this is all of us that believe in having housing whether it's affordable housing, whatever, if you believe in having housing, especially in a county and state in crisis, crisis when it comes to housing, uh, we all need to have the, the tips and tricks to have the conversation. So the first recommendation is to tell stories that balance people, places, and systems. And so a story that I tell, I tell my own story very often because I struggle to live in the area and I am a middle-class single woman and I still can barely live in the area. So, and that, and that is, it might be easier to tell other people's stories, but if as an individual, again, as a professional working communications in this arena, you're gonna tell other people's stories. But as an individual, you can tell your story um, to people. And I'm very open about my situation. So you can tell your story and help to start remedying the issue. So another really important one is to not directly contest the public assumptions. So we do this often. So basically we went through and talked all about these public perceptions that are happening. And then I think the inclination is to automatically be like, wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. We, we need to re-educate you. We need to, and I don't believe in, I don't believe in 
education and communications. I believe in marketing and communications. So showing people the solution, not, not educating them on it. And so I think that we're so quick to just try to educate people and say, oh no, you're wrong. You're making all these assumptions and they're just wrong. But that's not a good communication methodology in order to get it done right. So that's something to think about too. And I ask so often for people to be able to have real conversations on social media. We've been given this amazing tool and whatever platform you appreciate most, but we've been given this amazing tool where we can actually communicate with people perhaps that we don't know. I mean, obviously it's great to have an in-person conversation, but that's not always gonna be your opportunity. And I try to kind of interject where appropriate, where it's not a stu where it's a, uh, a productive conversation, not where it's just like this really charged, everyone's just yelling at each other. Because what we have to do is have a conversation and be able to have a conversation with people across the table that feel differently about us. So let me get to the next one because I have 10 and I have 20 minutes. So, okay, so tell the story of us rather than the story of them. So this is something I've kind of already touched on. So I tell my story and I try to link it back to my peers. That's, I mean, my whole radio show is called DG the 30 something because I am trying to do my best to be the voice of millennials and my uh, my generation and be honest about it and bring stories in that talks about the us in the situation, not the them in the situation. Which again, I think that institutionally this can be really hard. So I think as an individual, it's a little bit easier to be able to, that's not true. I'm gonna retract that statement immediately. I think that a lot of individuals can't talk about us. They can only talk about me. Uh, and so I think that that's a change in the dialogue and institutionally it's you have to be able to understand what it looks like to talk about us and so it's, sometimes it's putting yourself in the shoes of someone you're not potentially in and then again understanding that you're not just telling your agency story you're telling the, the story of the us not the you that's really important so ooh, this is one of my favorite ones because I believe in not working in silos and so bring the connection between housing and other issues into sharper focus. So as I said, that environment and built environment is one of the social determinants of health that affects your health. And so I talk about this all the time, that there is this connection between public health and housing, as well as, what is it, four or five other elements, but right now we're talking about housing. Um, and I think place matters is another one in here. So we'll talk about that when we get there. But... I, if you follow my show, you know this is something that I talk about all the time, health equity. And so we see a lot of certain coverage that is very isolated. And this talks about the media coverage. It's very isolated about we need housing, we need housing, we need housing, we need housing. But it doesn't make the connections of why that's important for a person's general health or their general well-being. And the fact that if you have an unhealthy community, if you have an unhealthy person or persons, you have an unhealthy community. Um, so it's not just isolated to that one family or that one person is the community doesn't thrive. Um, and again, that's something that's very hard to get people to understand. Very hard. So help people connect to the causes and effects of housing insecurity. So same thing, uh, there's a huge lack of understanding of how housing works, what it takes to develop it, uh, the bureaucracy that has to be gone through, the what is affordable. That's something I put down in my conclusion is what's considered affordable. Um, and as we saw with the median household income at $71,000, $72,000, and then the need to make $139,000 in order to have the average price, that kind of shows where affordable would have to be. I mean, it would have to be half the price, right? If you're really gonna talk about what would be affordable to people and then the expectation that you're supposed to pay a 30 year income in housing costs, which is, I don't know how people do it. Uh, especially when you have families and stuff. Again, as a single individual with just a dog, I feel like it's manageable, but um, 
you know, with all these other costs, it's pretty significant. So that is that one. I'm just going to power through here. Cause again, I only have 15 minutes. Oh my gosh. Thought I wasn't going to take up that much time. Okay. So make it, this is the one I was talking about. So make it clear that where you live affects you. So place matters. We know that we know that people in different, uh, places and where they live affects their, again, their overall health, their success. Uh, and if you really do believe in equal opportunity and, and equity, then you would allow housing to be in neighborhoods where there's higher levels of success. If that's what you really believe in, which I don't think a lot of people do. I don't think most people do, to be honest with you, whether they preach or not. So place really does matter where you live matters. Uh, and I am one of those people that I do genuinely believe that we need to provide opportunity for people to live in communities that thrive while we're also addressing communities that are struggling uh, with, again, better community development and planning in order for them to be successful, where you have those community investments, but you are still addressing the fact that you don't want to push out the, the population that's there. You don't want to cost them out of their own housing situation. So it's okay to raise challenges of the past, but focus on the kinds of change that lead to better outcomes. So this is, I think a lot of these bullet points are talking about providing a solution instead of just highlighting the issue. So again, we realize that there is an importance for affordable and fair housing. We, some of us, uh, but we can't linger in the challenges of the past. And again, this gets back to that crisis mode conversation. I make that that parallel there where um, we can't just focus on the crisis in the past. And oh my God, this is, I mean, there are super important facts. But again, we need to message things in a way that people can understand and actually want to affect change. So, uh this one's intuitive again if you're in any sort of messaging it should be intuitive to everyone but uh giving examples of situations that worked so it always helps people to have examples of situations that worked like when did it work uh and when did it not work but again we don't want to focus on the negative we want to focus on the positive focus on the positive so when did this work um and so number nine is avoiding leading with or over relying on terms of housing and affordable housing. Oh, I love this one. So this goes back to my comment about gentrification and how loaded of a word that is. Uh, and I guess I should have defined what a loaded word is because I use, I use that all the time, that saying. But a loaded word is something that elicits a very significant response in the other person. And then it also can be leading. Sometimes loaded words are used to lead people into a conclusion. Uh, and in psychology and all of our research and stuff, we never want to do that because we don't want to lead people into their an, into a conclusion. We don't want to elicit a response. We want to be able to have a conversation and have a genuine answer, whether we agree with it or not. But you want to have a genuine answer. You don't want to lead people to respond a certain way. So... Again, we need to rethink how we talk about communities and how we talk about housing and how we talk about affordable housing. I, I rarely, I have said affordable housing more times in this presentation than I probably have in the last three or four years because again, it's charged. Uh, people don't understand it as we've gone through this entire thing. So I try to avoid using affordable housing as uh, a description. So, um, and again, this is one of my favorite ones too. Widen the public's view of who is responsible for taking action and resolving outcomes. It is all of us. And the government plays a portion of the role, but they don't play the entire role. They, uh, we need community partners at all different levels, whether it's the nonprofit, the local city government, the federal government, the community foundations, the housing authorities. We need all of that support in order to really get to this end goal that we're looking at. Um, and 
as stated before, is most people just don't understand how any of this works. And so, you know, people don't get involved. And, and I, you know, in my gut, I don't say this because it's not productive, but in my gut, I think I have the response that a lot of people have is where you can't complain if you're not involved. Uh, but again, especially when it comes to housing and many other issues, but since we're talking about housing, you do have those really loud voices that come out in force, but then you don't get to hear the other side of the conversation. That's a really common occurrence that we see. So, you know, um, we're here on community radio. I think that I get to express my opinion and I, I welcome anyone that wants to come in here and talk to me and have a different opinion or however, but, uh, you know, we need to be able to have those conversations. And so, you know, in closing, I went through a lot of information and again, I think that this is a huge conversation to be had. Uh, I love this report. It helped distill it down into, and again, I will go back and, uh, at the end and make sure to give the the due rights to the information uh so um so i went through the solutions and i think that the bottom line for me is we need to be able to tell stories that people everyone can relate to that's the the global in a perfect world, we're going to come up with solutions and stories that can accommodate everyone. Now, is that really going to happen? Probably not, but I think that that's what we need to aim for. And again, back to this question, what is affordable? And, you know, there is data out there about what's considered affordable and what's, you know, market below market, all that information I don't have it in front of me. But again, just going back to the difference between the median household income and then the necessary income. And again, I'll repeat it again. I think I've said it three times. The median household income is less than $72,000 in Sonoma County. And then the required amount to afford. And again, this is this is analysis based on interest rates and, you know, what what would be affordable uh, to you would have to make a hundred and was $128,000 a year in order to afford a $640,000 house responsibly. Um, it's not to say that you couldn't, you couldn't do it otherwise, but, um, I think that that discrepancy shows. And then the, the, the homeowner occupancy versus renter occupancy was almost split. I think it was 55 and 40%, 45%. There's always room for error. There's, you know, that little percent that doesn't make the, the cut or is the other. So, you know, those are big things about what's affordable. And I don't have the answers. Uh, today, I just wanted to talk about the conversation because so many of us are trying to have this conversation and that's great. Uh, but we also need to know how to have the conversation. And I talk a lot about that in all my different shows is that, you know, we constantly are telling ourselves our own narrative and we need to make sure and I'll say a we because uh, you know sometimes I fall victim to this too I'm I'm a professional in messaging in government and you know sometimes we all slip up and so we need to start thinking in more of the tribal group mentality so that when the story comes out it's more about us and it's more about having functional, healthy communities as a whole. So I am at the end of my time. Again, if you have questions or want, oh, I did want to give the credentials back again to this report. Um, so it was written by, so it's called, you don't have to live here. If you just Google, you don't have to live here. I think report or housing report, you'll get it. Uh, but as you don't have to live here, why housing messages are backfiring and 10 things we can do about it. So please, please read this. Like if you are at all interesting or if you are in housing, this is a fascinating read. So please read it. Uh, and it's quick. It's quick. It's not a 70 page dissertation. So again, Tiffany Manuel, PhD, Vice President of Knowledge Impact and Strategy at Enterprise Community Partners. And Kat Kendall Taylor, PhD, Chief Executive Officer of Frameworks Institute. 
And again, I have their, I'm not gonna read their emails here, but if you are interested, please contact me and then you can contact them individually. Thank you for the Sonoma, I think it was the Sonoma County Community Foundation for providing a presentation about this study, which read me, uh, led me to this report. So thank you very much. You are listening to KPCALP, Petaluma, California, 103.3 FM. I hope you join me on the 30th for the next show.